We are starting with SmackDown as Cody Rhodes faced Solo Sokoa in the main event, and in the closing moments of the show, Rhodes, Randy Orton, and Kevin Owens had Solo cornered. Just when it looked like Solo was going to get his due, Jacob Fatu made his debut and attacked the trio, and capped off his night by putting Rhodes through a table with a top rope splash. SmackDown went off the air with the Bloodline and its newest member standing tall, and this attack has had quite the effect on the reigning undisputed WWE Champion. After a victory over Shinsuke Nakamura at a live event in Bloomington, Illinois, Rhodes revealed that he suffered two broken ribs in the attack and was also taped to show off his injury. Rhodes even said that the word backstage was that he'd surely be allowed to miss the Bloomington show and possibly the next SmackDown, but his answer to that was hell no. Fightful Select reports that last Friday's SmackDown was considered within WWE to be one of the biggest since WrestleMania, making clear just how significant this show was. We'll have to see how Cody Rhodes will be able to combat the Samoan werewolf in the coming weeks, as it is clear that the American Nightmare will not back down no matter what. SmackDown in Chicago fittingly kicked off with CM Punk, who addressed the fallout from Clash at the Castle, where he cost Drew McIntyre in his World Heavyweight title match in Scotland. After discussing Drew's loss in his home country, Punk mentioned his alliance with Cody Rhodes in fending off potential attacks from the Bloodline. Later on in a backstage segment with DIY and Grayson Waller, a noise interrupted their segment, and a garage door opened to show a battered and bloodied Punk lying on the floor. As the door raised, it was shown that McIntyre, who had seemingly quit WWE on Raw, had been the attacker, and Drew dragged the bloody punk to ringside so the Chicago crowd could see. At the entrance, McIntyre was confronted by SmackDown GM Nick Aldis and security intervened to restore order, and Punk was transported to the hospital in an ambulance. Fightful Select has learned that the beatdown segment was rehearsed and planned meticulously, and WWE went the extra mile to ensure things went perfectly. While the segment went perfectly, there was a slight issue later on, as after SmackDown, Punk could be seen leaving the Allstate Arena in his car, shattering kayfabe. After all, Punk had supposedly already been taken away in an ambulance, so this fan-recorded footage of him driving away shows that this was not the case. It's been reported that the plan is for Punk and McIntyre to face off at SummerSlam, with the attack being a way to write Punk off TV so he can focus on being fully healed for that event. With that in mind, we'll have to see when Punk makes his return to TV, but after this assault by McIntyre, he might be gone for some time. Was Punk leaving on his own accord a mistake, or is it fair for him to leave outside of kayfabe given the show had already ended? Share your thoughts in the comments. In recent days, there has been significant talk about Shane McMahon possibly appearing in AEW, even after Tony Khan told the Wrestling Observer he's never met or spoke with Shane O'Mac. It's also been confirmed that Shane hasn't been discussed at a high level within AEW either, so what exactly is going on with WWE's prodigal son? Speaking on Fightful Select's Q&A podcast, Sean Ross Sapp said that Shane was not debuting in AEW, but said that McMahon had indeed been in talks with talent. Sapp noted that anyone joining AEW would typically communicate with Tony Khan directly or through someone connected to the company. Whether Shane joins AEW or not, the mere notion that he may be has seemingly inspired WWE to take action, at least according to the rumors flying around backstage. The rumor among WWE's creative team is that Triple H met Shane last week to discuss settling their differences as the CCO wants to bring his brother-in-law back into WWE once again. This comes over two years after Shane was fired by his father Vince, but there's no confirmation about how the meeting went and whether an agreement was reached. For those who may not be aware, Shane was let go from WWE in early 2022 following a messy situation at that year's Royal Rumble where Shane worked both backstage and in the ring. Shane helped produce the Men's Royal Rumble, though help is a strong word, as it was reported that his ideas were all done to serve himself, including demanding a late entry spot. Shane also insisted on a now infamous spot in which he improbably won a striking exchange with Matt Riddle, a legit former MMA fighter, and had some ideas that weren't used. McMahon also butted heads with the other producers, including Jamie Noble, as the two disagreed on using stars like Bad Bunny, who was also in the match. Shane McMahon was frustrated on the day of the Rumble because of his ideas being shot down by his father and WWE chairman Vince McMahon, and it was Vince who decided to fire him. 
In fact, Vince is reported to have told someone close to him that his son would never get another pop in the company again as long as he was in charge of WWE. Shane's role in the match was his first bout for WWE after losing a steel cage match to Braun Strowman at WrestleMania 37, and Shane spent less than six minutes in the Rumble. Despite this short time, an SEC filing revealed that the 52-year-old veteran was paid over $800,000 for his time in the match, and for a while, it seemed that this was the last fans would see of him. That was until WrestleMania 39, and though he appeared, he is not under any contract with WWE but does have a separate agreement that allows him to be in WWE 2K24. What do you make of all this? Would you like to see Shane return to WWE or should he join AEW? Perhaps he should set up his own wrestling show? Leave your views in the comments. More from Jacob Fatu as with his arrival, fans are intrigued to see what's next for him, especially after his impactful debut and destruction of Cody Rhodes, Kevin Owens, and Randy Orton. Some have pointed out that given he demolished three of WWE's top babyfaces, why Fatu would serve under Solo Sokoa, and that concept may be brought to TV. On the Not Sam podcast, Sam Roberts, who has connections in WWE, suggested a power struggle between Solo and Fatu that'd mirror the relationship between Roman Reigns and Sokoa. The idea is that there could be a power struggle between Solo and Fatu, especially if Jacob is left to do all the physical work while Sokoa gets to grandstand as the faction's leader. This wouldn't be too dissimilar to how Roman Reigns rarely got physical, instead leaving Solo Sokoa to do the work for him, putting his own body on the line for the tribal chief. If this is the plan, it'll be interesting to see how Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa fit into the situation, as bringing Jacob Fatu in may be a plan that backfires for Solo Sokoa. So Jacob Fatu is now in WWE, but many feel this should have come years ago. And why exactly did the move to the biggest wrestling company not come until June 2024? Fightful Select reports that MLW sources have told them that Fatu's career has been hindered by his criminal record, which is why he hasn't wrestled outside the US. For those who may be unaware, at age 18, Fatu was arrested for armed robbery, leading to an undisclosed jail term, and this may have played a role in WWE not signing him earlier. As for what this means going forward, that's difficult to say, as Fatu may not be allowed to appear at international events, which have grown more frequent in recent years. Fatu's background was cited as a primary reason he had not been hired earlier, but WWE's newer management had reportedly been interested in him for some time. Additionally, sources noted that Fatu had made a positive impression within WWE and had shown a respectful attitude towards everyone backstage. After serving his time, Fatu has been able to establish himself as a force to be reckoned with in wrestling, and it'll be interesting to see what he does now that he's finally arrived in WWE. All we know for now is that Fatu is the latest member of Solo Sokoa's Bloodline, a faction that looks almost entirely different to this time two years ago. This has led many to speculate that Roman Reigns' return will see him lead a faction of his own against Solo, especially after Sokoa declared the Tribal Chief is never coming back. But what do you make of this idea? Would you like to see Reigns return with a group of his own? Let us know in the comments section down below. For as many members of the family in WWE already, there's plenty still yet to join, and after Jacob Fatu's debut, Zilla Fatu took to social media to say, see you soon. The son of the late great Umaga only joined the wrestling business in recent years, but is already impressed, and it may just be a matter of time before he makes the move to WWE. We already mentioned that there are some who feel Jacob Fatu should have been a part of WWE already, and that list certainly includes Mark Henry. In addition to being a wrestler, Henry has often worked as a talent scout, and it was the world's strongest man who first encouraged the likes of Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill to enter wrestling. On a recent edition of the Busted Open podcast, Henry shared that he's had eyes on Jacob Fatu for some time, and even pitched to WWE about bringing him in. He said, Jacob Fatu really should have been in WWE 5, 10 years ago. He had troubles. He was somebody that was on my radar. I wanted him. I wanted to make him a Mark Henry guy, and I kept being told no. I'm so glad. I thank God every day that people get second chances. And for him to get his on a stage like this is super, super impressive. Henry certainly has an eye for talent, and now Jacob Fatu is getting his chance in WWE, and fans can expect big things from the former MLW World Champion. 
Since 2016, Kayla Braxton has worked for WWE under a variety of roles on Raw, SmackDown, and NXT, but now her time with the company is coming to an end. On social media, Braxton shared that this Friday's SmackDown from MSG will be her final appearance for WWE before she goes off to pursue the next chapter of her life. Braxton spoke highly of her banter with Paul Heyman, was appreciative of Michael Cole for bringing her into WWE, and appreciates the efforts of Triple H and Nick Khan. Kayla described herself as an outsider who was welcomed into wrestling with open arms, something she'll always be grateful for, and is excited to share what's next for her. This announcement by Braxton comes after on June 6th, she removed WWE from her social media username, raising questions about her status with the company. At the time, WWE told Fightful that Braxton was still with the company, though much more has emerged since then. In an update, Fightful reports that Braxton is currently working for the company under a verbal agreement after her WWE contract recently expired. The two sides have been in discussions, but the outcome of these talks hasn't been disclosed, and the fact she's publicly shared she's leaving suggests a new deal wasn't reached in the talks. It's surprising to see that Kayla Braxton will no longer be a part of WWE after this month. We'll have to see what the future holds for her as she embarks on the next chapter of her career. While Kayla Braxton's departure from WWE is imminent, fans have been left wondering what's next, with some believing she could soon be joining AEW. According to Fightful's report, AEW was made aware of her contract status weeks ago, though it is unclear if this was due to direct communication between Braxton or an agent and AEW. Tony Khan has made clear in the past that he tries to avoid speaking with talent who are still under contract, as doing so could be seen as contract tampering. With Braxton under a verbal agreement and not a contract, it's unknown whether Khan would feel comfortable reaching out to her, but AEW would certainly benefit from her skills. Do you think Kayla Braxton might make the move to AEW? Or does her next chapter lie in a different company, perhaps outside of wrestling? Give your thoughts down below. For weeks now, Liv Morgan has played mind games with Dominic Mysterio in her efforts to take everything from her fierce rival and former friend Rhea Ripley. At a recent WWE Live event, these mind games continued as Morgan grabbed a fan sign with Dom Dom Rocks and a picture of Mysterio and gave it a kiss. This comes after last week's Raw saw Morgan wear Mysterio's vest, which Dominic demanded that she take off and refer to herself as Daddy's Girl. Morgan was also seen wearing a Dirty Dom t-shirt and also wore the shirt at the WWE Live event and made clear to Dominic, I wore this shirt for you. When WWE shared a clip of this on Instagram, asking Dominic for his thoughts, he shared an image of a child giving a thumbs up as Mysterio seemingly approves of Liv's fashion choice. It certainly looks like Dominic's resolve is crumbling after weeks of Morgan's advances and don't be surprised if it crumbles completely in the coming weeks on Monday Night Raw. Since 2018, Bloodsport events have blended the world of MMA and pro wrestling, and the majority of these events have been hosted by former UFC champion Josh Barnett. In addition to Bloodsport, Barnett made a notable appearance at AEW Wrestle Dream last October as he competed in a singles match with Claudio Castagnoli. Speaking on the Jackson podcast with Quentin Rampage Jackson, Barnett shared his thoughts on the experience and revealed that there were plans for a collaboration with AEW. He said, it was fun. Mainly, I was just there because the event was announced to take place in Seattle as an Antonio Inoki tribute show. Although it didn't fully live up to that billing, the chaotic nature of these events makes it so hard to manage everything. So I reached out to them and said, if you're going to have an Inoki tribute show and don't include Inoki's top student from Seattle, that's just not right. We managed to put something together. While there were plans for more, it ultimately ended up being a single match with Claudio Castagnoli, which was a fantastic experience. I wanted to get out there and see what they had to offer. Barnett's Bloodsport has seen AEW talent compete, including John Moxley and Johnny Dynamite, and he recently told Tokyo Sports that he'd love to have Katsuyori Shibata at an event. In that same interview, Barnett said he'd love to have Shayna Baszler back, but also said that Bill Goldberg is on his list of dream competitors for a future show. Bloodsport's most recent event happened last week and saw the first event of its kind in Tokyo, Japan where Barnett took on John Moxley. Clearly, Barnett has big plans for Bloodsport, but what do you make of his comments and his hope of Goldberg fighting at a show? Let us know in the comments down below. This August, WWE will host Bash in Berlin, the company's first PLE in Germany, and many are expecting a major role at the event for Gunther. Though he is Austrian, Gunther made a name for himself in Germany's WXW promotion and has a huge fan base in the country. 
But what does WWE have in mind? According to Zero News, the current plan is not for Gunter to face Cody Rhodes, as many had suspected, but that match is being saved for a bigger event. With that being said, fans can expect Der Ring General in a title match in Berlin, and this show will come mere weeks after he challenges for the World Heavyweight title at SummerSlam. Whether it's as challenger or champion, Gunter will have a huge role at Bash in Berlin and expect the Ring General to receive a thunderous response from the European crowd this August. It's safe to say that 2024 has been a tough year for Darby Allen, who has dealt with a foot injury, a facial injury, was hit by a bus, and was part of a gruesome bout at Double or Nothing. After the intense anarchy in the arena match, it was reported that Allen would be sidelined indefinitely due to his injuries, but he's keeping busy out of the ring. Allen took to Twitter and uploaded a video showing him lashing a fan a couple of times at the Supreme New York 30th anniversary party to the delight of other guests. We should clarify that the fan being lashed did request this from the former TNT champion, and we hope that they were able to get some ice to heal from this unique and painful moment. As for Allen, it's difficult to say when he'll wrestle next, but at least on this occasion, it was somebody else getting the worst of things, and not Allen himself. On last week's Dynamite, MJF defeated Roosh in what was the former AEW World Champion's first match since World's End back in December 2023. MJF missed months of action due to a series of injuries that piled up during his title reign, and when speaking to Fox, MJF said he feels great and is ready to go 110 million percent. MJF is set to square off against Hachicero at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view on June 30th, and judging by these comments, MJF will be at his very best this weekend at the show. When the Hurt Business was split up in 2021, not once, but twice, the consensus at the time was that the faction had been broke up too soon and WWE had made a mistake. Even Roman Reigns, who at the time was leading the bloodline, felt the group broke up too early, but it appears that Reigns may have played an inadvertent role in the group's demise. On Instagram, MVP shared a post of the Hurt Business during their time on top of WWE, and one fan claimed that WWE took the Hurt Business's gimmick and gave it to the bloodline. In response, MVP said that this was the case, and this comes after MVP has said that Triple H has turned down efforts for a reunion within the group. Three years later, it isn't known whether WWE actually ended up lifting the Hurt Business's concept and giving it to the Bloodline, but MVP certainly believes that to be the case. Would you like to see the Hurt Business be brought back even without the released Shelton Benjamin? Or has that time passed? Sound off in the comments. On the latest episode of AEW Collision, Kazuchika Okada squared off against the legendary Ultimo Guerrero as part of AEW and CMLL's working relationship. Despite the talent of both men, this match was widely criticized for not living up to standards, and there was also controversy surrounding Guerrero working under a mask. According to Lucha Blog, AEW promoted Ultimo Guerrero under his masked persona, even though he has been wrestling unmasked for nearly 10 years. By the time he arrived at Collision, Guerrero was not informed in advance that he would need to wrestle in a mask and had not brought one with him, leading to a frantic search backstage. This all culminated with Guerrero wearing an ill-fitted mask that repeatedly slipped off during the bout, and this issue also affected the match itself. In an effort to prevent the mask from dislodging, Guerrero reportedly omitted several planned spots, impacting the overall quality of the match. Despite editing attempts, the mask issues persisted, preventing the match from being the showcase it should have been, and hopefully a rematch will deliver a much better contest. Speaking of AEW Collision, the show saw a ton of notable names at the on-screen event, but an important name from TNA Wrestling was spotted backstage. Fightful reports that Speedball Mike Bailey was seen at the Collision Rampage taping in Allentown, Pennsylvania's PPL Center, and was there visiting friends. Bailey received a warm welcome due to his extensive connections in wrestling, and this comes as Bailey's contract with TNA is set to end this year. Companies have shown interest in working with Bailey, including a near deal with WWE a couple of years ago that was ultimately affected by changes in their hiring guidelines. Could Bailey's presence at Collision sow the seeds for him to join AEW? Only time will tell, but given his talents, the speedball shouldn't struggle to find work no matter what's next. At Forbidden Door, TBS champion Mercedes Monet will face NJPW strong women's champion Stephanie Vacker, with the winners set to go home with both titles. 
At CMLL's Fantastica Mania event in Arena, Mexico, Vacker was in the ring celebrating a victory before being confronted by Monet, and the pair shared some verbal barbs. This all led to Monet slapping Vacker and a brief brawl interrupted by security, but during the fracas, Monet posed in the ring with both titles. That could very much be the scene we see at Forbidden Door and expect both women to give it their all this weekend at the huge crossover event. Now, injuries are an inevitable part of pro wrestling, and no company is immune to them. And over its five years, AEW has seen some of its top names fall victim to the injury bug. CM Punk's World Championship reigns were seriously derailed due to injuries, and Brian Danielson has missed time due to setbacks, which have caused a major impact on the show. Speaking with Bleacher Report's Doc Chris Muller, Tony Khan discussed injuries in AEW and how they've impacted his booking decisions. He said, It's happened so much, talent injuries, and we've had to change so many things. You know, the Young Bucks reference this body count, and they're not altogether wrong. I mean, it's true. Since they started this reign of terror, I'm not the only person they put out and injured. FTR has injuries going back to their anarchy in the arena and their ladder match with the Young Bucks, so we have FTR out. Right now, Kenny Omega, Darby Allen, Jamie Hayter, and Adam Cole are all out injured, leaving Khan with no choice but to book around some of his top names being on the shelf. And we're ending with SmackDown as the blue brand has undergone a major change as Fightful Select reports that longtime creative writer John Swicata has been promoted to lead writer. Little is known of Swicata, with the only public mention of him in WWE being a 2014 tweet from Road Dogg, but he has been with WWE for several years. A source pointed to last week's massive SmackDown as a sign of Swicata's work, and with such a blockbuster show, expectations are high for Swicata as the Blue Brand's lead writer.